one of the happy accidents of the, uh, the conference schedule is that there were three Drupal Commerce sessions, and two of them are happening right now. So the other half of us are in the other room. If you, if you, want, if you meant to be in the other room, I'm not presenting the Lullabot case study, although I could if you want me to. <laughs> part, part, of the, part of their case study actually will be in the deck here because we, we did a little collaboration with them. But uh, there also was, um, this morning, was anybody in the UNHCR presentation? No? So the, uh, Vardot um, uses Drupal Commerce for the UN to collect uh, refugee donations. Or, well, re refugee relief donations. They don't, yeah. uh, so it's a pretty cool, like, uh, multinational, multi-payment gateway, like, multilingual everything, multi-multi uh, instance of Drupal Commerce. Um, so worth checking out if you just want to watch the video later on. And I mean, like, it's nice to see like Drupal for good, you know. Like we're actually helping put food in the in the mouths of and, and shelter over the heads of refugees all over the world. So another cool one during the COVID era was there were multiple pharmaceutical and healthcare companies using Drupal Commerce, selling at-home test kits, um, advertising, of course, the various vaccines and things. You know, it was kind of cool to see again Drupal and Drupal Commerce, you know, making it a real-world impact. Has anybody lost a lot of money to a crypto scam? No? No? Okay. If you go to uh, bulkorder.ftc.gov, you can uh, order free, uh, free literature to help your community avoid crypto scams. That was neat. The guy that developed the site met us on the street uh, last night and was showing us his website. Oh, cool. What's that? Binance did. Binance did, yeah. It's justly deserved, I imagine. <laughs> And I know they're trying to hit Coinbase too. Uh, yeah, yeah, I see that. And that's where, like, that I use their custodial wallet uh, for, like, the Bitcoin that I have or whatever. Because I thought, okay, they're trying to do everything by the book. I'll just stick it in there and forget about it for 20 years. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right, well, we will uh, get started. It is 3 p.m. on the dot. Um, I think this session is like 50 minutes, give or take. Um, so I'll, I'll right. Okay. So I'm happy to field questions throughout. If you just have any questions while I'm either talking about something or demoing something, uh, I'll also make time at the end. Um, and the beginning, uh, it may be like a bit of a slow start. We'll see how this flies. But uh, it's it's kind of trying to situate our work within the broader vision and mission for Drupal that the Drupal Association advanced you know, in, in the keynote and in our presentation earlier today. So uh, just by way of introduction, um, these are the folks that have worked on Commerce Kickstart in the past, although, Tom, I'm sorry I didn't have a fifth slot for you. <laughs> so we'll just have to point to you instead of point to you up there. But um, I'm Ryan Zarama, uh, founder and CEO of Commerce Guys, now called Centauro, as of 2019. Uh, we uh, got our start um, doing consulting for Ubercart websites because I wrote Ubercart in 2006 through 2009. And in 2010, uh, we began the Drupal Commerce project to basically re-envision what e-commerce on Drupal could look like, which at that time just meant taking advantage of fieldable entities, which we probably all take for granted nowadays, but were a new thing back then. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the genesis of everything that we're still doing today. Um, Jonathan Saksik is the core maintainer for Commerce Core. So all of the Commerce Core releases and most of the, the patchwork in there, Jonathan does for us. He's based out of Tel Aviv. Uh, Ivan and Sunchitsa are on our engineering team in Belgrade, Serbia. Ivan is our front end lead. Uh, he implemented the Belgrade theme. Our designer is also there in Belgrade. Hence the name of the theme. Uh, and Sunchitsa is our ambitious site builder. So the, the, she really is the target um, profile for what we're building Drupal for. Somebody who can manage configuration from the command line, but also click everything together and knows how Drupal works conceptually to a very high degree. Uh, and then Tom also is a more recent entrant maintaining the commerce license module and some payment gateway modules that are also part of Commerce Kickstart. So Tom's our US lead. Um, and longtime Drupaler himself. So, um, and so, uh, like, one of the things that we have to ask ourselves on the regular, because we've been doing this for a while, uh, personally, been writing Drupal e-commerce modules for 
17 years, which is basically an entire career, right? I, I, it's, it's a generation. <laughs> why then still do it? Um, why, why do we want Drupal Commerce to succeed uh, and, instead of just like helping people integrate Drupal better with Shopify or Big Commerce or Magento on the open source side or Cilius or PrestaShop or any of the myriad of different e-commerce platforms that exist? And the reason for us, the, the, the compelling motivation for us is that we do have a vision that we're advancing. And our vision for the future is where merchants go to market on their own terms, unconstrained by their commerce platform, and free to do what's right by their customers. Um, and and that, that second part, like really, I mean, like it's nice not to be, you know, stuck to a vendor roadmap. So of course, like feature lock-in or vendor lock-in, like that speaks to a certain kind of technical um, business leader. Um, but doing what's right by our customers speaks to me like the bleeding hard free open source software enthusiast. Like, I don't want trading your customers' private information to be like the cost of doing business on the web. Um, when we talk about an open web, when we talk about what we, what we want the future of like the human experience on the internet to be, like, I'd much rather it not be surveillance capitalism that wins. Uh, but that's what Shopify does, right? They're, they're data hungry, and they're using that data even to compete with their own merchants now, right? If, does anybody have the Shop app on their phone? No? Okay. I do. I have no clue why. I think I got it to like track a package one time. But if I buy coffee from my friend's coffee shop, which is on Shopify, I then get shop bucks that Shopify uses to advertise to me everybody else's coffee. So my buddy has now just completely fed a new customer to his competitor because Shopify really doesn't care about his business. They really just care about transaction volume because Shopify is a payments company, not really an e-commerce platform provider first and foremost. So we're, we're trying to advance this vision for the future. And that's why we, we do what we do. That's why. Um, that's why we deliver professional services to have a business. That's why we try to grow. In one sense, it would you know it could be simpler to shrink the company and have fewer mouths to feed and fewer projects to manage. But shrinking implies limiting your own reach and your your own ability to to perform. And we we want this vision to win. And we now like squarely or see ourselves squarely within that broader mission and vision of the Drupal Association. So I think in the keynote, Dries presented this, the idea that the Drupal Association envisions a future for an innovative, inclusive, and open web. And conducting commerce on that open web is important. If you cannot do that on the open web, the open web will not win because people conduct commerce. That's what we do. Uh, and if it's not going to be on a free and open internet, it will be in uh, WhatsApp or WeChat chats. You know, like if you go to China right now and you do e-commerce, you're buying through WeChat. If you go to the shopping mall and order orange juice out of a vending machine, you're paying with WePay. Like the, 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 the idea that, that, that we advance as the future of the internet and the web it's, it's in a sense losing because the customer experience isn't there, the convenience isn't there, and of course there are other issues, you know, from a political standpoint, you know, shaping that environment in China. But uh, we want to join and, and very, very clearly join the Drupal Association in its vision for the open web because we really, we really want Drupal to succeed. So that's, that's why we do what we do. Um, that's why we continue to work on Drupal Commerce, uh, you know, after 13 years. And we'll likely continue doing it until my children tell me it's time for me to go to seed or they decide to take it over from me. So, <laughs> um, so just to give a quick project update, uh, right now there are about 21,500 sites running Drupal Commerce on Symphony Drupal or Modern Drupal or however you want to call it. So Drupal 8, 9, 10. We need a new phrase for that, whatever that bucket phrase will be. Uh, that would be the 8.x-2.x branch. We opened our 3.0 branch a, a little prematurely, like two years ago. And we were like, I guess we didn't actually need to do that because we, you know, we, we, didn't, we just didn't have to. We, we, I think we did that around the time Drupal 9 came out. So that's why there's one site. And I have no clue who that site is, but it tickles me. Um, so uh, we're at, like I said, 21,500 online stores on modern Drupal. We also still have about as many legacy Drupal sites. Uh, I'd love to see a lot of them come over to the current version of Drupal Commerce, but I think as with Drupal itself, most of those sites are probably not very active, not maintained, or they're just biding their time until they go to a SaaS platform. And I, th I think it's, it's true of core Drupal. It's going to be true of us, but we'll, we'll try to win as many as we can. That's part of what this presentation is about as well.
Um, at a glance, this is the feature set. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to talk through all this. I, I assume, you know, at, at least some of us I know have built Drupal Commerce sites before. Uh, has anybody never actually used Drupal Commerce? Some new? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, the, the idea is, like, the feature set out of the box, especially if you use our starting distribution called Commerce Kickstart, it's, it's going to be equivalent to an entry-level Shopify. So you have products and variations and attributes, although there are no limits on the number of variations or attributes you can have. We have price lists, and you can have unlimited price lists to target different prices for individual customers, user roles, or whatever, at date ranges if you just want a seasonal sale or something. Uh, we have a core promotion platform. This is a, a big improvement over Commerce 1.x. As of Commerce 2, you have the full ability to create and define promotions, coupon codes, and so on using a little conditions engine. It's not the rules module for Drupal. It's just a, a simplified inline conditions module that we created uh, just to make it a little easier to manage. Um, and at, at the end of the day, like rules was nice that we had it in Drupal 7, but it was just too much for non-technical users, and it was not enough for developers. So why stick with it? We ditched it. Um, but th there's there's a lot inside, um, and we don't we don't necessarily do a great job on like DrupalCommerce.org or Docs.DrupalCommerce.org to cover all the features. But it's just because there's so much, <laughs> and and the same kind of people that are really good at creating Drupal modules are not typically the same kind of people who are really good at creating documentation, <laughs> unless it's inline comments in a module file. So uh, it's it's a perpetual project, but one that we're always working on. Um, the uh, current version of Drupal Commerce or of Commerce Core is 2.36. We've had like three or four releases this year. Um, recent features are like adding the ability to automatically create a user account as part of checkout completion, to assign an order to an existing user if they already had a user account but happened not to be logged in. Uh, to um, enhance promotions with the ability to, say, like, set your free shipping discount based on the order subtotal, excluding tax, it's kind of important. Uh, it also means that you don't have these promotions that cycle on and off, because once shipping gets added to the order, it goes above the free shipping threshold. And then back then, you know, that's, you know it, it was solving a good problem. Uh, you also have the ability to, to fine-tune the application sort order for promotions from code now. For those that, that need that feature, that's kind of important. Um, it's fully Drupal 10 compatible, so Commerce Core and Commerce Kickstart and all of the modules that it contains run great on the latest version of Drupal. Um, keeping up with core releases is important, you know, because it's just good housekeeping. Um, if, you, if you don't keep up with core, then suddenly you're going to have deprecation notices and have a big lift from one major version of Drupal to the next. But by keeping up with deprecation notices and tracking core, I mean, it's really not that big of a deal anymore to upgrade to the latest version of Drupal. So big change, of course, obviously, from the days of like Drupal 7 and before. And then finally, um, Tom's work recently was getting us to a full release for the commerce license module. So that now supports things like not just licensing an entity to somebody, uh, and I'll, I'll get into this a bit in, in subsequent slides, but, but also say like renewing my subscription manually. So coming back to a website that doesn't use recurring billing, buying the same membership product a second time, and it extending my existing license's expiration date versus giving me like two licenses that overlap. You know, it's a nice feature for those that don't want to get into recurring billing and dunning management and all that stuff. Uh, and then, you know, one of the things that I wanted to highlight, like we, we, we reference the project as, uh, we call it Drupal Commerce for various reasons, but it, it, it can be easy to lose sight of the fact that the Drupal part is actually really important because it does make our platform very compelling uh, as, a, as a, a way to sell content, to sell access to content. And there, that takes many different shapes and forms, and we'll discuss those in this session. Uh, but there are other e-commerce platforms in the world that sell file downloads, but they're not CMSs. They, they don't have the tools that we have to, say, integrate with S3 and sell access to download a four gigabyte you know, video file without hosing your PHP server because you're trying to serve these massive files up through that. Um, they don't have uh, nice, fine-grained user role and permission systems like Drupal has. So if you're trying to build a content access platform or a subscription website where you're able to access certain parts of the website based on a membership level, 
you know, there just there aren't that many solutions that are all in one. So you basically end up having to use a purpose-built solution for like events, like C event or something, or a purpose-built tool for. Um, Gosh, I don't even know. Like, where, where would you guys like Substack? If you're trying to let's say subscribe to newsletters or something, like, you, you could use a purpose-built tool like that, but you don't have to if you value some of the other things that Drupal brings to the table. Um, so let's get into like the, the the suite of modules that power these kinds of digital commerce use cases on Drupal. And I actually feel like I, I did this a little bit backwards. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip ahead a few slides and then come back because I was just kind of like dancing around like what are the use cases. And so, so each of these use cases, I, I didn't get kind of like, uh, what's it called, uh, portfolio rights from all of my clients in advance of this talk, so I just described them. Uh, but these are real world use cases, projects that we've had in the last year, two years. Um, and you know, they, they, they range from simple content access, like a literary journal that sells you know, web access by granting a user role to somebody who buys a one year access pass. Uh, to like full-on B2B file downloads management platform. So this is a company that sells tens of millions of dollars of PDFs because they write the standards for their industry. They have to distribute them somehow. Previously, they used NetSuite. NetSuite is not a CMS, right? Well, they used Suite Commerce on top of NetSuite. So not a CMS, doesn't have great search features, had vendor lock-in as far as the roadmap was concerned. So they couldn't make a nicer customer experience. So they chose Drupal because it's first and foremost a great content management system with a great faceted search engine, if you've used that before. Uh, and then we added Drupal Commerce to it. Then we added the group module to it to define a business customer group. And suddenly, any member of a client organization for this company could access all of the files that anybody in that company had purchased access for the company to get. So you, know, you have a purchasing manager buying everything for the company, and then anybody can just go grab the documentation they need. It was a really cool use case, massive project. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, all these projects are, are driving forward the, uh, the feature set of the modules that we maintain. Because in any client that we get, where we're adding features to publicly contributed modules and write that into our contract. Like improvements to open source modules will be contributed back to their communities because we're not trying to just lock down a bug fix behind you know, some, somebody else's IP. Um, we have continuing education clients, so multiple trade associations targeting civil engineers, targeting medical imagery, targeting um, uh, psychiatric medicine, like all these like companies that support industries with continuing education programs have various forms of like selling access to private content pages, webinars. Uh, one of them I thought was very interesting. They actually give away all of their quizzes and content for free. Um, so you can do everything you need to be certified, but then when you want to buy your, when you want to like actually publish your certification somewhere, you have to pay to get the certificate off the website. I thought that was interesting, right? So their, their content, it's, it's essentially just a, a free product that they give to everybody in their industry. And then if you want to put the little paper up on your wall, it's $25 and you can print and download the PDF. Um, but you know, all of these industries have some form of continuing education requirement. And I, like, if any of you know like, what conference those kinds of companies go to, I'd love to know <laughs> because we have the perfect tool set for them. And so finding and reaching those kinds of customers, I think, would be a, like, a great way for someone to develop a solid line of business because they, they just don't have many alternatives. Uh, and then finally, we have a, a multi-vendor marketplace that offers its individual sellers the ability to publish advertisements in the marketplace because the advertisements are just nodes. And so you're creating a node. And then if you want to publish it, you have to pay. And suddenly that content is now published and active in their ad rolls and everything. So these are just like some of the use cases for selling content itself or access to content. Um, and one of the, I mean, all of this really stems from one of our earliest Uber card adopters. Um, anybody watch like Mystery Science Theater? Is that familiar to any of you guys? Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's just, you know, goofy movie commentaries. And uh, they were huge uh, Uber card and now Drupal Commerce users, even to the point that like Mike Nelson at one point like recorded a video for us to show at a DrupalCon with a coupon code for free product. It was a lot of fun, but it's like, like those kinds of companies that find Drupal because of its content management capabilities. We now equip them to transact directly within Drupal so they don't have to do some weird, janky like bolt-on of a third-party platform. 
And we're actually working with um, a customer right now that also offers B2B products uh, to help uh, companies certify various um, standards, ISO standards, GDPR standards, a lot of like regulation, uh, regulatory compliance products. And they have WordPress with um, uh, a separate platform to check out, just like a hosted checkout platform stood up beside it on a subdomain. And so suddenly they, they just they lose this continuity between what were you viewing? What have you purchased before? How, how can they possibly recommend to somebody who's on the content website uh, a, a particular page or a coupon or promotion based on their order history when they have two completely separate systems that don't talk to each other? Literally just a, a query parameter and a link to a subdomain that does all the work. So, so that's where Drupal Commerce begins to, to really show value to these kinds of companies. Um, so just to run through the, the module set, um, commerce license is kind of the foundation of everything. So when we talk about selling content, what we're really tracking is your ability to do something, your entitlement or your grant. So the license entity just pairs a user with some form of entitlement for a period of time or for an unlimited period of time. It doesn't have to have an expiration date. Um, you have uh, workflows for licenses, so you know they're they're pending until they're activated upon payment, or what we would call order placement or full order payment. You can kind of pick when that happens. Uh, they can expire after a manual, you know, set set time. This is based on uh, configuration in the product variation itself. So you even could sell like. Uh, the literary journal, uh, they have like a one year or a three year pass. Well, it's just two different product variations on the product page. One has one expiration date, the other has another expiration. Uh, and um, you know, once that license entity exists, cron just kind of keeps everything humming. Uh, you can react to events like license expiration to send out an email. We have the commerce email module that just kind of lets you create emails in the browser. Um, and it's just a, just a way to build out the, the basics of any kind of a digital commerce store. Uh, the module does include, and, and this is all based on a, a plugin type. Uh, I don't know if anybody's written a plugin before. It's, it's pretty easy. You just kind of put it in the right folder in your module folder, and it just is discovered. This is the, the magic of uh, you know, object-oriented PHP and um, composer auto-loading, yada, 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 all, all the stuff under the hood in Drupal. Um, that plugin just gets discovered and now can be used to say, like, my product variation is this kind of license. You know, it's a role-based license. So commerce license would let you sell a user role out of the box. But it's also really easy to define your own license type. Um, I think we have streaming licenses for a, um, a private video, uh, like a film distributor. Um, they, they, they sell a streaming license that then gets tied into their DRM system for actually like live streaming um, content. And defining that was literally just one plugin file. And if it needs custom fields, you just add them in the base field or bundle field definitions or plugin field definitions, whatever the, whatever the function is. I've done it to help a friend sell uh, flair in his, in his video game, you know, like you can go buy a, a cool sword or a cool hat or something, you know. So, we just put license keys into the database and then pick a license key whenever a license is activated, stuff it in that license entity so it now belongs to my user. And so long as I'm connected to his game, it knows what licenses I have in my account. So it's you know, d designed to be just a, a, a very simple abstract way to, to create, manage, and uh, like expire licenses as needed. And then on top of that, you know what, let me pause. Any, any questions about like the license feature set itself? I'm talking like pretty fast, so we'll chill. All right. Well, on top of license then would be commerce file. And as you might guess, commerce file defines a license type. And that license type is a file download. And so what that lets you do when you define your product variation is just upload files to it. And once you complete checkout, you have a new tab added to your user account page. It just says files and any variation that I have a license to view its files, they would be listed there for me. What, and what that means is, let's say that I have an ebook that I'm selling through Drupal Commerce. Uh, if I produce an update to the ebook, I don't have to go back and update every single license on my website. I just go to that one product, remove the old attachment, put the new one on there, and now everybody, you know, when they visit this user interface, will see the updated files. Uh, this can handle any number of files. So as with the standards body, they could sell both the, uh, you know, the, uh, the document itself and the change records and the addenda. And, and all five files or whatever attached to that product variation 
would appear <clears throat> in my account interface. And finally, um, like it is important, you know, for, for file file sales websites not to be nuking their Drupal application server with the actual download of these files when they're large. Um, so we help maintain a large uh, stock videography website. And uh, they were basically, uh, how is this working? At first, all of their files, so just gigabytes and gigabytes of video files were on the Drupal web server. <coughs> but using the S3 file system module, uh, we were able to use Amazon S3 to store files that were uploaded through the file field and then create download links directly to S3 from that file download page. So that, it's kind of self-explanatory, I guess. But any questions about the file feature set? And I'm going to try to deal with this bug <coughs> in my throat. Yeah, yeah. So the um, <coughs> wow. I hope I can recover from this. <coughs> Tom, if you know, feel free to answer. If not, I'll answer in a sec. You have some, I think, but I think I got the same button. Right, um, yeah, you could, we can we can expire. So basically, again, uh, whether unlimited or on a rolling interval, uh, recurring all of the other features we were talking about earlier. <coughs> mm-hmm. And then we also add to that um, IP access based restrictions. So you get like five IPs and after that no more downloads or, or just 10 downloads total and then you're done, that kind of thing. And actually, those are plugins as well. So there's the unlimited <coughs> plugin, the, uh, the rolling plugin, and uh, the reference date based uh, time plugin. So that can also be extended if you have some unique characteristics that you're using your system. Any other questions about file downloads or moving on? All right. I thought I was better. One sec. Goodness. I don't know if I'm just allergic to something in the Pittsburgh air, the steel dust. Or... <coughs> Finally, we have commerce recurring. And of course, this, this ties it all together for like a recurring subscription. Uh, based site access, you know, if you actually want to automate recurring payments, uh, commerce recurring can do it all. <clears throat> and you have two basic paradigms for managing recurring billing within Drupal. One is to use uh, a payment gateways recurring billing feature set. So that would be um, like the automated recurring billing features of Authorize.net, um, of PayPal, a, a purpose-built platform like Chargebee, Recurly, Chargely, whatever. Uh, Zuora, if you're up market in the enterprise, uh, or some of those other services. Um, or you can use Drupal Commerce itself. And we support fairly robust use cases for recurring billing because it uh, was originally developed to support the billing for platform.sh. So those who don't know, uh, Commerce guys developed platform.sh, and then we split the companies in 2016. I think the billing interface is actually still Commerce 1.x if you're, if you're paying your bills through platform.sh. But the, the feature set is designed to support uh, you know, either fixed intervals, so it's uh, you know, on the first of every month, your, your, your membership fee recurs. We can prorate that, so if you sign up halfway through the month, then your first order is discounted by the amount of the month you know, that's already elapsed. We also support a rolling interval. So that would be like if I subscribed on the 13th, I renew on the 13th. Or if I subscribe on the 31st, then I renew on the last day of every month thereafter, not the 31st for obvious reasons. Um, we also support metered usage. So this would be the use case where, say, on platform, you have a, uh, a small and a medium and a large account all active, and halfway through the month, you switch your medium to a large. Okay. Your bill is not finalized until the end of the month, so you can see how many days of the month were you at one level until you went to the next level. And that's the you know, classic metered usage use case. Another way would be like, let's say you can just access the website and download everything to your heart's content, and then I charge you at the end of the month based on the number of downloads. Or we built a uh, job board in uh, Germany, it was like a, a, for German universities. And there it was just create as many uh, job postings as you want throughout the university network. And then you would be invoiced and billed at the end of the month based on however many you posted. 
So it supports a, a wide variety of use cases. Uh, and this, this works through a subscription entity. Uh, that subscription entity also has like a billing period uh, that's going to be, like I said, based on a rolling interval, a fixed interval, whatever. That would match up, hopefully, with, with the licenses that you're selling. So if it's a one-year license, then you'd have a one-year subscription. And when that subscription renews, uh, then the license itself would be renewed or it's, its expiration date extended by however long the period of that license is. Um, and there's, there's a little bit of you know, trickiness in here. That's why I kind of spelled it out so it's in the slides for you to refer to later. But what, what happens is you're on your initial checkout, your initial order initiates this subscription and we immediately create a draft recurring order. So I can look in my orders uh, interface in Drupal Commerce, I can go to the, the, the drafts tab and I can see all of the pending uh, orders uh, that, that will recur across all of my subscriptions. And that's nice because you can then comment on it, you can manage it, you can change the payment method associated with it. So basic customer service functions based on that next order. Uh, and then whenever Cron detects that that order is ready to close, that's when payment is collected. If the subscription is not expired, then it would be renewed for another month. But if it was, say, like a, a one-year subscription with monthly payments and you reach the end of it, then it would, just, it would close out entirely, trigger a different event, yada, yada. Um, and that's all just kind of automated through commerce recurring. We do use queues. Uh, so it's not like one, one really beefy Cron is going like, to you know, bring down your site because you had 1,000 subscriptions. No, we would queue up all of the activities to be uh, performed and then you know, process them asynchronously. And that's just a good pattern, and you'll see this throughout Drupal Commerce in general. Uh, if any site that you're building has these kinds of operations that operate on like a user-based level or that could potentially be blocking to some sort of a like page request, like a checkout completion, what, what we prefer to do is just queue up that blocking or potentially blocking activity, process it asynchronously, and then let the customer, the end user, carry on with their day, but not have this like 40 second long checkout completion submission where they then start spamming the button to see what's wrong. Um, and that's, that's you know, important for obvious reasons, but you know, we've had sites that had you know, tens of thousands of items in the queue, and if we just tried to process them all synchronously from within the main application server, well, it would just die. Uh, so if you're, if you're thinking about scale for Drupal and Drupal Commerce, pretty important. So. Um, we've already done, of course, the use cases. So skipping ahead, you know, what, what we want to show is that all of, all of these features, with the exception of recurring, which I just took out of Commerce Kickstart so we could tag a 3.0.0 without it, and then we'll add it back in, um, they all exist in Commerce Kickstart. And Commerce Kickstart is a, uh, a distribution of Drupal, uh, which means that whenever you go to the installer, you aren't installing a Drupal installation profile. It's literally we just take over the installer to build a store so that once you complete the installation process, it, it looks like you're looking again, like at a Shopify template or a big commerce template. Just It's all there with demo content if you want it. Um, and the, the reason for Commerce Kickstart, again, we, we ask ourselves, why are we doing this again? You know, was it really that big of a deal? And, and the answer is, like, we, we want Drupal Commerce to grow. Like I said, we want it to win, to succeed. We want our vision to be more accessible to more people. Uh, and, and features won't drive adoption if people don't know how to use it. Uh, like, like Drupal is not just a thing you can grab off the shelf if you're a casual you know, web page editor or whatever you'd call yourself if you're not a developer. Uh, and we want it to be even easier. So that's, that's what Commerce Kickstarter is there for. It's, it's there to make it easier to get started and also to, for us to find new ways to drive adoption. So as I mentioned before, there are still a lot of Commerce Kickstart 1.x sites. There are also still a lot of Ubercart websites. Even though it hasn't been worked on in years, there's still some 13,000 Ubercart websites. And if they're going to go somewhere, they, they need some kind of a target. So it's one thing to just like grab a Drupal Commerce site from Drupal 7 or an Ubercart site from Drupal 6. And say, so, okay, here's how I would build your website in Drupal 9. Do you want me to do it for you? It'll be like $80,000. And like, oh, hold your horses. What if there was a simpler way for me to just migrate over? But if, if, you have a, if you don't have a fixed target, then it's hard to create any kind of an automated or a generally available migration plugin. So now I know with Commerce Kickstart, I can target the average Ubercart use case and migrate that to the fixed target of Commerce Kickstart and its feature set and hopefully try to get some of those, those users to come over. Um, but again, may, maybe many of them won't. I don't know. But what I, what I do know is 
there has to be some easy way for people to understand what can Drupal Commerce do, how can I target it to migrate my sites or my customers or whomever over, and that's what Commerce Kickstart does. Um, it actually peaked at like 13,000 users in the Drupal 7 cycle. Uh, we actually won't see usage stats for distributions on Drupal.org anymore, I don't think. Uh, may maybe we will, but you know, it's, it's just the whole composer packaging system is a bit different. Uh, at least with Commerce Kickstart, like they, they were, the distribution was pinging home to say, yes, I'm running this thing, and it has a release on Drupal.org, but we don't have a release of Commerce Kickstart anymore. You'll see why in a second. Um, but you know what what it has. Um, yeah, we, 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 okay, we're doing even better. Blah blah blah. Okay, so what it has is basically a, a composer command. You run it from the command line, so that, that's still a bit of a technical hurdle. Maybe we can find some way to make it easy to just spin up in Pantheon or, or Platform or Acquia or whatever. But it's an installation profile that, that takes over the full installer and gives you the ability to install feature modules, demo content, etc. It's also a default store theme that's mobile friendly. Um, it's based on Bootstrap, but it doesn't depend on the contributed Bootstrap theme. So we, we built Bootstrap ourselves just to be leaner and not to have the overhead of the, the Drupal Bootstrap theme. No offense to whoever maintains that, it just it wasn't something that we wanted to have to contend with. But then that also let us um, do integrations with Layout Builder. So you have full Bootstrap Layout Builder integration. So you know you have pretty uh, pretty nice content editing and layout building tools all out of the box. And we also created what, what we call like our certified projects meta package. And so these are projects that, that typically we maintain or we at least contribute to that we know work well together, that we know have test coverage, that we know are documented, and that we know, you know if, if we were going to go build a client project today, that, that we'd feel comfortable using them. So we have a roadmap to add additional ones to that, but you can see the current list, it's on our GitHub um, profile, it's Centauro slash certified projects. Um, but all, all that's in the you know in the deck and, and available on Drupal.org as well from the Kickstart profile, um, and so it's all tied together through this project template with Composer, and you'll see it's just a single command creates the entire code base, and then you know with one more command you can get the demo content, and then you type ddev config ddev start, and boom you've got a site. Uh, so we're actually going to do it live. Let's see what happens. Maybe maybe I'll have internet access. Maybe I won't. Um, but let's see. So. Uh, I'm, I'm literally just typing out that one line command, so composer create project. Um, I'm doing dev stability for now. Um, obviously, we'd love to not require dev stability, but we need to package everything up, get full releases out, and then that won't be necessary anymore. The project is just called Centauro. And you know what? Can I zoom on this? Uh, how do you zoom? It's just okay. I don't know. That's funky. All right. Uh, composer create project, uh, Centauro slash commerce kickstart project. I'm going to throw it into a live demo subfolder, uh, and I'm going to ignore platform requirements because my laptop has a PHP 7 instead of 8. But it's going to be fine. So just that one command now fetches everything I need. You, got, you can also customize the installer, which is kind of fun. So we put the Centauro pur purple in there at the end. Um, and you know, of course, this is going to manage all of the dependencies as well. So, so even though we only have, say, like seven or eight projects of our own in Commerce Kickstart, because we also use Bootstrap and all these various Bootstrap um, layout builder integration modules and some other just utility modules like Advanced Queue for our queuing and all that, Composer manages all of that. <clears throat> it also lets us apply a few patches that do things like take over the installer to, to theme it specifically for ourselves and that kind of thing. Uh, so we're now installed, um, and if I just go into that directory, I, I'm going to just type ddev config. Uh, ddev is our preferred local uh, development environment. If you're not using it, if you don't have anything else, I highly recommend it. Obviously, at the end of the day, just use what works for you, uh, but don't use Vagrant. All right, and then we go ddev start. <laughs> um, and now my site's ready to roll. So whenever I go to my browser, um, which... Should just take a second. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be dumped right at the installer. Um, and uh, what DDEV also does that's nice um, is it does give you MailHog, uh, which is kind of just a, a service locally for capturing email sends. So of course, when you're doing your local testing of an e-commerce website, you don't want to accidentally email your customer. Guilty. Probably one of the first mistakes I ever did was email my entire customer list from our ERP. I, this was 20 years ago. but. 
Um, Mailhog's good for that. It also has great integration with SQL Pro. So if you're using SQL Pro on Mac, uh, or, or you can just use PHP my admin from the web if you need to just look at the actual database. So highly recommend DDEV for a variety of reasons. Um, opening the site, you'll see I, I didn't necessarily believe in myself, so I did have like another copy ready just in case, because <laughs> uh, I didn't know how, how the Wi-Fi would hold up. But this is what the installation process looks like. So of course it's nice, pretty, and themed. Um, it's going to first install Drupal Core. Uh, give me the kind of basic um, site uh, configuration screen. Uh, but then uh, you'll see step number six in the left sidebar there. Uh, it's going to prompt me uh, to um, kind of choose some default configuration uh, to, to install. And so what, what we've begun doing, and, I, and I'm not sure like how far we'll take it or how long we'll keep it, but well, we'll keep it, but I don't know how far we'll take it, is we aren't using features. So that, that, I mean, features means something specific in the Drupal world. Um, we, but we are providing default configuration in sub-modules of Commerce Kickstart. So if all you need is a basic product display, using one of our starting features, we're just going to install that config for you. And so long as you don't ever change that config, then we will apply updates. So theoretically, you could build a small website for a friend or for your family or whomever, you know, put in basic physical products with a basic taxonomy-based catalog, and then just keep running Commerce Kickstart updates and never have to touch it yourself, and get new features added to the, PD, to, to the product display page data model or small improvements to the search catalog. So it's just trying to, like, it's, it's somewhat similar to the recipes um, initiative that they're kind of advancing in Drupal Core, but it's just our way of, of approaching this from the standpoint of, like, we want to help people like, manage those simple use cases but at the end of the day, we, we really are still gearing this toward, uh, toward bigger projects that, that just want a good, simple starting point. Um, and so there, there are some architectural things under the hood that make it easy to use Kickstart, both as just a, a quick, simple sales demo or a quick, simple store builder, or just ignore all that stuff and use it as a development framework or like starting point as well. So like our new projects start from Commerce Kickstart. Um, I am going to go ahead and grab the demo module. So once I add that to my um, code base, I gotta ignore platform requirements again. Uh, I, will, I will be given the option to install a full demo store. And this demo store has uh, not the taxonomy-based catalog, but a full search API-based catalog with facets and so on. Yeah? Sorry to interrupt. Is there you good? a great path from a 1.0 commerce demo? There is not, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a... It's very, very different in approach. We're using default content, and so it's, it's yeah. Uh, but good question. Yeah, we have we have other branches of the commerce demo module for modern Drupal or Symphony Drupal, but uh, this is kind of a clean break. Um, but uh, it, it also has you know a lot of sample content, which I wrote cheeky descriptions for one evening. I was watching Netflix. All right, we're gonna have some good descriptions. That was a lot of fun. But. Um, uh, all the images are just from Unsplash, so they're Creative Commons, you know, free, freely licensed. So you, you can feel free to use this in a sales demo and just show people, here's what Drupal Commerce can do for you out of the box. Um, and I'll, I'll highlight specifically in this talk, since we have a limited amount of time, I'll just highlight the Digital Commerce feature set. But there's more in there, obviously. There's, there's a whole product catalog with all the search API integration. If you need to know how that works, you can go see how facets are built in Drupal Commerce. Um, but uh, you know, ha having this for me as the the primary salesperson at my company uh, really accelerates that. Like, hey, let's have a call to prepare a demo that's been lightly customized for your use case. Like, I, c I can go in there with one hour of work and um, uh, like show a client, like or a prospect, really, um, how how quick and fast it can be to get them toward where they need to be. Now, obviously, I'm not building their entire site in my pre-sales engineering. But um, you know, at least proving the concept that the flexibility of Drupal is is like a value all in its own to any growing, shifting organization. Um, we do use the Symphony Mailer module for HTML email delivery. Um, for that, you have to do a little bit of importing of uh, uh, some mail uh, transport settings or something. So I'm just going to import all of those. We also have config splits. Um, so a config split is just a way to say like. If I'm running locally versus running in production, use different sets of configuration. Um, so we have that, and DDEV makes it easy to use Drush. So I'm just going to Drush, config, split, import, DDEV. 
and import that configuration. And now it's, it's off to the races. I mean, the, the, the demo store, everything is ready to go. So again, this is a layout builder powered homepage um, with various just content marketing features and a little Boyan Zivanovic uh, Easter egg. He was the original developer of Commerce 2 before he left us. Um, you know, some basic uh, merchandising features. Uh, obviously, if you wanted to browse the product catalog, you can go see the entire catalog, filter by various forms of taxonomy, um, sort, search, etc. cetera. Uh, and within the product catalog, uh, we have certain products that demonstrate buying uh, media, either in physical format or digital format. And the way that we accomplish that is just with a different product variation based on the version that you're buying. And this is a fairly recent feature uh, that was funded by that standards body. It's the ability to have one product type reference variations of any number of product, uh, product variations, or any number of types of product variations. So it, it used to be a one-to-one -one correlation. So if you wanted a different product variation type, AKA the file download product, you had to have a different product type. And that was just unnecessary overhead and probably a bit too detailed for this talk, whatever. Um, but you can see here that I have two variations. One is the hard copy using that, uh, the media physical product type. Another one is the licensed download. If I edit that one, uh, you can see like what I'm asked to provide for my license type. So here I'm selling a file. You know, I can attach the file. I can upload additional files if I want to. I think this actually may be the actual book. We like printed them off of the Gutenberg project. Yeah. <laughs> So that's fun. Uh, and um, again, as I mentioned earlier, if I, we support unlimited file attachments you know, for the modules. So if I added additional files here, if it was you know, you're selling a CD, and so you have the cover art and the, the music itself, you know, you've seen all that stuff, the, the, the miniature movie that goes along with the album or something. You know, it can all be in there. I can limit how many times a user could download it, or I could not. I could set the, the license to expire after a certain period of time. As I mentioned before, we support both rolling intervals, which just kind of renew based on the date of activation, or I can support an interval based on a reference date. So like this file is good until December 31st, 2023, and then everybody loses access to it. Whatever the case may be, we support that. Um, if I go back to the product, uh, I'm gonna add the digital download to my cart. <coughs> And let's see how smart checkout is. All right, we were smart. OK. So if, if I also had physical uh, products in my shopping cart, then of course I would have to supply a shipping address, not just a billing address. But since I only have digital products in my cart, I'm simply asked for my payment details. I could put in a coupon code if I want. Uh, this is just an example payment gateway, so obviously not paying. Uh, let's provide a name and address and continue to review. Let's not save the test credit card. Uh, but I can see a summary of my order details. Obviously, I, I don't know how much you know, people know or care, but Drupal Commerce does not store or retain any form of credit card data. Uh, any of our payment gateway integrations always tokenize at the third party payment gateway. And typically, we're using iframes embedded from their payment servers on the checkout form. So literally, payment card data never passes through your web server. And this is the way to achieve the simplest form of PCI compliance. So I'll just throw that out there. Keep that in mind. If you're doing a payment gateway integration, we have a variety of uh, modules that can provide a reference for you. Um, once you're done, I have immediate access to download the file that I've just purchased. And again, if I were to uh, go to my user account uh, interface, um, if those files ever changed in the future, so would my files list. Everything that I have access to would be revised here. My license could be updated to grant me additional downloads, to edit the expiration date, whatever you need. And this, of course, you know, can be customized on a one-off basis, site to site, because it is just a view, as with most things throughout the Drupal Commerce interface. Finally, I can see all of the licenses that have been purchased across all of the users in my store. I can manage them all together here as well. And those licenses will, will let me um, see an activity log of all of the, you know, the, the, the key dates. When was it activated? When did it expire? I can comment on that license if I want to by creating a log entry here. Same as the order management interface for commerce as well. Uh, and then finally, on the right-hand side, you can see where I can manage the state of the license if I wanted to revoke it because I just decided I didn't like this person anymore. I could do so, and then suddenly it would be gone from their file download interface. 
Um, so that's the, the feature set at a glance. And again, all of this comes out of the box. If you need to demo it, Commerce Kickstart literally takes two minutes to set up and, and have prepped to go into a demo. So I'm, I've done it very last minute myself. Um, ideally, of course, we have time to prepare and tweak things to be a little custom, but that's all there. And next up will be, um, you know, we'll have a, a minor release of uh, Commerce Kickstart that includes just a template for, for role-based memberships. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get back into demonstrating recurring billing as well through some default configuration modules. Uh, but we got like two minutes left. That's most of the content that I have. The rest, I will just put, uh, we'll put the slides online. It's just kind of talking about some of the lessons that we learned. You can also read about this from the README in Commerce Kickstart. Uh, but just ways, ways to make a distribution that can also be useful to developers who don't want all the cruft. We've made it simple to get rid of the cruft and just use the kind of base project template as well. So, there are any, any questions at all from anybody in the audience? Yep. Guys, great job. Awesome. Thanks. I really like your work. Um, <laughs> I uh, set up the commerce demo. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So I was like, okay. Well, <laughs> so I ended up, you know, spending a lot That's of why we will not lose our jobs anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actually did test out the theory. I'm like, okay, well, ChatGPT set it up. I can see what I can do, right? So, yeah. Anyway, so I, I got some limited stuff working with it, and it, I was interested. But I, there's a lot of work going on with the ECA module. I don't know if you've heard. Not familiar, yeah. Interesting. I guess like the, the fifth iteration of this in Drupal, yeah. I had my own at one time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, so like from a from a policy standpoint, if you will, wh why have we not pursued any of these? And and the answer is really just because these systems are too complicated for the average end user, yeah. but not robust enough for the average developer. Yeah. So they don't really serve anybody really well, exactly. you know. Yeah. So that's why that's what we kind of say when we when we just prefer use what we have. Let's make this the interface as simple as we can for merchants while still being ro robust enough. Uh, but then we just prefer custom custom plugins, you know, if if you're a developer. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the short answer. Yeah. Yes, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious if you guys have on the roadmap or if you already have a demo for doing this. Yes. Yeah. In fact, that we we hoped to have that done by now, but we did not finish it. But yes, we have the the Commerce API module that provides a full suite for using Drupal Commerce as a backend for a headless front end, and we we have very, multiple clients doing that ourselves. I'd love for us to have like Commerce Kickstart out of the box be like a back-end provider for Next Commerce or for View Storefront. I think that would be awesome. We're not there yet. Um, we do have like a React project template. You know, we, we can demo it, but it's, it's, it's nowhere near this level of polish right now. But definitely on the roadmap. Yeah. Yes, Matt's demoed that. Yeah. Yeah. So I got time for one more quick one, or we can wrap up. Yes, sir. You started the talk um, about content. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, is role-based licensing the best approach for that? It, uh, yeah, so the question is, like, what, what is the best way to sell access to content? And it really kind of depends on the model of the business. Um, this journal, you know, they just sell a user role, and then we had a custom module that, that implemented the paywall. Because we're tracking how many articles have you read this month. OK, you're at your limit. Would you like to subscribe? You get your pass. Well, we know if they have the user role, then we bypass those checks. But in the past, I've used, and I don't know where the ecosystem stands today, so caveat emptor, these might be Drupal 7 modules only, but um, like the content access module and access control list module, the ACL module, those would get you down to the granular level of you're purchasing access to view this node. And, and we've done that through custom, a custom license plugin in the past. 
but I, I don't know exactly where the contrib ecosystem stands today. But. And I guess we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up there. Happy to riff on that further, but thank you for your time and attention and for all your support.